have to be very careful how we spend our time because Mm -hmm. all you're going to get is 24 hours a day. And and I tell people all the time, do anything, but don't waste my time. I will get more money, but I will not get more time. And I don't know how much time I have. And I don't want to know how much Mm -hmm. time I have. Mm -hmm. So the spending of your time is critically important. And that's why you cannot spend major time with minor people. You cannot spend a lot of time with someone going nowhere Mm -hmm. because they want you to go there with them. (laughs) Nowhere. Mm -hmm. And people not doing anything want you to not do something with them. Hello, everyone. This is Jerry D. Reno Clark with www.clubrhino.net, welcoming you to another issue of Power Tips. In this issue, we are definitely standing on the shoulders of one of America's foremost giants. His name is Mr. George Fraser. And George Fraser is the author of two books, including a critically acclaimed bestseller, Success Runs in Our Race, The Complete Guide to Effective Networking in the African American Community. He's also the creator and the publisher of the award-winning Success Guide, the networking guide to black resources. And Mr. Fraser, the thing about him is that he is one of the most powerful networkers on the planet. He has learned these skills from the many years that he spent in management with Procter & Gamble and United Way and Ford and so forth. He's a speaker and author, and he's appeared on more than 250 television and radio talk shows. His views are solicited by media as a versus CNN and the Wall Street Journal. He speaks more times than I do in a year. I thought I spoke a lot with over 100 engagements, but he speaks over 150, about 200 times a year, all around the world. So we're going to have an opportunity to listen to an individual that Upscale Magazine named one of the 50 power brokers in black America. Black Enterprise Magazine called him black America's number one networker and featured him on his cover. And personal growth guru, Stephen Covey, who you all know, called Mr. Fraser a masterful teacher. So, Mr. Fraser, I want to welcome you to the program, and thank you for being with us. It's an honor. Excellent. Well, let me ask you about the strategies and some of the things that you've learned over the years, being named, being recommended, and being on the media, and being on radio shows, and people all over the world want to get your input and advice in regards to networking in regards to entrepreneurship. So let me ask you, how did this all start for you? Did you grow up where your mom and dad said you will be an entrepreneur? I mean, how did it work for you? Well, it evolved. Like all things in life, they evolved. I started out managing for 13 years of Procter & Gamble's health and beauty aid business in the Northeast. So I spent 13 years in corporate America. Then I moved on to United Way spending three years as an executive in communications and marketing with United Way here in Cleveland, Ohio. And then I spent two years with the Ford Motor Company. So I spent about 20 years, nearly 20 years, working in the public and private sector in various positions, working with and through people. Wherever I worked, I was able to get along very well with people. I was able to climb the corporate ladder very quickly, achieved a very high level of success in a very concentrated period of time. And what I observed was that I did this through working with and through people and through the relationships that I accrued and developed wherever I decided to place my hat to do my work and experienced a lot of success relatively early in life and decided after 20 years that I wanted to do what I could to teach people what it takes to succeed, how to start a business, how to earn more money how to improve their life, and all of it really through relationships. I believe that life is all about relationships and that business is all about relationships, that it's not business and relationships, it's relationships and business. And if you don't have relationships in life, then you really don't have a business and you really don't have much of a life. Hmm. So I started thinking about this. I started writing articles about the power and importance of the relationships in our lives, and started doing some of my own soul searching and taking inventory, in a sense, of the people that I knew and wished to know and didn't know. And one thing led to another, and I ended up committing my life to teaching, sharing, 
this whole idea of networking effectively and how we must do it and what it is and what it isn't. I've made a career from this one word, this one idea of relationships or networking. You know, I'm blessed. I mean, it's an anointment. That's awesome. I've been able to make an incredible living from it, but because I've applied the same principles in which I have espoused, and that networking is giving first, sharing always, the getting comes later. That's a whole subject matter that we can spend lots yeah, of Yeah, that definitely sounds like it. So being that you have really mastered networking, it sounds like it was a process of you going through your entire career and realizing that connecting with others and some of the relationships that was necessary for you to build to be successful in what you were doing in your corporate career really gave you the insight to say that, hey, I have created some success by utilizing this. People want to know what some of my secrets are, and it's based on a lot of these relationships that I've been able to build through the networking through others. So what are some of these key principles or what are some of the key insights on how people can be better networkers? Because everyone who's listening right now, they would love to know how to be better networkers. That's their whole career is all about being in direct sales and network marketing. But this could be available for anyone who's in the stock brokerage industry, the real estate industry, insurance industry, any industry, as you were just talking about, as far as networking. So can you give us some of the strategies, some ways how we can be more effective networkers? First, let's define networking. Let's Mm -hmm. think about what it is Mm -hmm. and what it isn't, because people have all kinds of definitions and all kinds of beliefs about networking. Now, I've written a best-selling book on the subject, so In my book, I define networking as the identification and the building of relationships for the purpose of sharing information, opportunities, and resources. And the emphasis on that definition, Jerry, is on the building of relationships and sharing. Because all of life, as I stated earlier, is about relationships with all kinds of people. In fact, there is no success that you can attain, sustain, or maintain on your own by yourself in a vacuum. It's all about relationships. In fact, if we think about this deeply, the most powerful asset that we will have in the 21st century will not be our computers. I don't care what people have told you. Mm. It will be our relationships. Because all entrepreneurship, all job searches, all upward mobility in the public and private sector workplace, all community building, all nation building are inherently networking initiatives, that it is your ability to shape the scope of your search for human resources and bring them to bear on your challenges and opportunities in life is what will ultimately determine your level of excellence or success in life. It is all about relationships. So let's look at life Mm -hmm. like a three-legged stool. Okay. You need all three of the legs for the stool to stand. The first leg, from my perspective, of the stool of life is education. We must get as much education as we can stand, whether it's academic, vocational, technical, informal, formal, it doesn't matter. But get as much education as you can stand and then understand that life is about lifelong learning, that we never stop learning. That's the first leg on the stool of life, and our parents helped us to understand that. Mm -hmm. The second leg on the stool of life is marketable skills that you must convert your education into a marketable skill. What is it that you can do with all of this education? I have a good friend who is now working on his second PhD, (laughs) and he has never had a job. Wow. I told him not long ago that he needed to get his behind out of college and get him a job. (laughs) Brother is an educated derelict. (laughs) He's still trying to raise his family, Jerry, on research grants. All right? Mm -hmm. You have to convert your education into a marketable skill. What is it that you can do with this education? Right. Second leg on the stool of life. And the third and final leg is relationships. Who do you know and who knows you? But most importantly, what is it that they know about you? Mm. Okay? That's very, very important. So we have to have relationships and develop those relationships and nurture those relationships at work, at home, and in the community. That's the third leg on the stool of life. I've met people that have good education, decent marketable skills, Jerry, but the personality of a box of rocks, (laughs) personal skills of a donut. (laughs) And these people have failed in life. Wow. I've met people with moderate education, decent marketable skills, 
Mm -hmm. but superior interpersonal and people skills. Their ability to get along and work with and through other people Mm -hmm. and develop the relationships in their lives that they will need to sort of connect the dots of their life is superior. And these people have climbed to the top of the ladder in every single field that you can imagine. These are people that are running everything in America. These are the most successful people. So relationships, your ability to nurture and to develop relationships at every level of your life, at work and home and in the community, is critical. In fact, let's think about this in another way. It is my deep belief that the key to success is directly related to your willingness to ask people for help. And whomever you're asking for help is, in fact, your network is in fact your infrastructure of support. Mm -hmm. As they know, as they go, you go. Right. Let me say that another way. Introduce me to your five closest friends, and that will tell me who you are. Okay? Wow. Mm -hmm. Let's say that another way. If you want to change your life, change your friends. Wow. (laughs) Be careful who you're hanging with. Be careful who you associate yourself with. If you want to change your life, you really need to change your friends. Don't spend major time with minor people. Ooh. People going nowhere want you to go nowhere with them. Mm. People doing nothing want you to do nothing with them. Mm. So you have to be careful how you spend your time. But all of us must spend more time on cultivating, nurturing, and developing relationships at work, at home, and in the community. Mm. So this is very, very important because we're not spending the time that we need. A good network or infrastructure of support is somewhere in the area of 200 to 250 cultivated and developed relationships. Mm. The average person today would have somewhere between 40 and 80. Mm Mm-hmm. Effective people, and there are all kinds of studies that Mm -hmm. have been published, but effective people spend about 14% of their time working on cultivating, developing, and nurturing relationships at work, at home, and in the community. But successful people, people Mm -hmm. who are at the top rungs of every ladder in America, spend about 54% of their time working on cultivating, nurturing, and developing relationships at work, at home, and in the community. They spend more than half of their life working on relationships. I spend more than 60% of my awake hours Mm -hmm. working on and nurturing and developing relationships. So it's very important that we invest the time in relationships that are constructive and productive. Now, there's a little principle that I live by that has served me very, very well. And that is everybody is important but not everybody is relevant. Relevant to where you're going, Mm -hmm. okay? Relevant in a sense that you can add to their life and they can add to your life. So we are constantly looking for new relationships, new friendships, changing acquaintances into friends and friends into customers or people that we are attached to by our heart, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking for and open to meeting new people, learning about people, bringing people into my life, and then doing the analysis that we all do as we go through life and grow older in life. And that is, does this person do one of three things in my life? Do they add, do they subtract, or do they divide, Mm. okay? Now, this is what happens. I mean, this is a concept. We're always bringing new people into our lives. We're always meeting people, shaking hands, open to new ideas and new conversations. But over time, you evaluate where those relationships are as it relates to your life. And there are no neutral people in your life. It is not possible to have someone who has no standing or is neutral one way or the other. That is not possible. People do one of three things, as I mentioned before. They either add, they subtract, or divide. Now, we know that we should not have people constantly around us in our lives 
who are taking away or subtracting from right. your life. Why would you want people in your life that subtract? Why would you want to be subtracting from somebody else's life? So you don't want people around you who are subtracting. You want people around you that you're adding to and they're adding to your life. Now, dividers are very difficult to identify because dividers make you think that what they want you to do is good. Mm -hmm. But this ultimately forces you, Jerry, to learn that everything that is good is not right mm. for you. Mm -hmm. You see, it may be right for them, yeah. but it's not right for where you're going and what you need to do. It yeah. might be relevant for them, but not relevant for you. That's exactly right. That's mm. why we go back to this adage of everybody is important, but not everybody is relevant. So as we analyze the people that come in and out of our lives, I mean, there are people who you are hanging out with at 22 years old that you don't hang out with anymore. That's right. Those people are no longer relevant in your life. They're not doing the same things that you're doing. They're not going the same place that you're going. They don't have the same values. They don't have the same goals and the same objectives. And it's not that they're bad people. They're just not relevant to where you're going. And right. you're not relevant to where they're going. That's right. So people do come in and out of our lives, and they were part of our network at one point in time. They're no longer part of our network. Let's look at this as a series of concentric circles, okay? okay? And we're going to have two sets of concentric circles. One will be personal relationships, and the other will be business relationships. The first circle is you. You are at the center of your own world. That's the first circle. Okay. Then you draw another circle around that circle, and those will be your circle of friends who are attached to you at the heart. These are your significant other, your family, extended family, people that are your favorite, that you have a special place and a special feeling for. Okay. That's the first circle outside of you. Remember, you're at the center of your own world. Okay. So these are they, like your heartfelt friends and These family. are your heartfelt friends. Okay. Okay. They have earned your respect and they've earned your trust over an extended period of time. Okay. Then we'll draw another circle. Mm -hmm. And the people that occupy that space are people that come into your life for a reason or a season. Ooh, okay. They're people that we meet all the time that bring something very quickly to us, or we bring something very quickly to them. They shed light on something. They kick you in the butt and get you going down the right path. They're there for a very specific reason. Your job is to identify them and identify the reason this person has been placed in your space and in your life. So that's the third circle around okay. you. And in the fourth and final circle, that space is occupied by acquaintances. These are the new people that we meet every day, mm -hmm. that we shake hands, we perhaps exchange business cards, and we begin the process of getting to know each other. But initially, they start out as acquaintances. Right. And if I could draw this for you, if you took that circle and the space between the acquaintance circle and the reason or season circle, you would put a bunch of arrows, all of them around this outer circle where the acquaintances are. Is it pointing these, outwards? or pointing no, and These arrows would be pointing inward towards you. Okay, got okay? it. Okay, so what we're saying is you're meeting new people constantly, mm -hmm. and these are the people who will ultimately flow into your life and become a part of your life either for a reason or a season or attached to you at the heart. But they will come from the new people that you meet, this outside ring of acquaintances. That's how you feed the needs that you have as you go down your path, this winding path of life. And you are at the center of this world. Now, Let's call those personal relationships. Okay. Then on the other side, we're going to draw the same kind of diagram, and these are business relationships. Mm -hmm. So at the center is you. Mm -hmm. The next circle around you are people who occupy that space. This is a business relationship. All right. Are your customers. Okay. They have a place of commonality. Mm. They have identified 
a need for your product or service, that which you offer. Right. Okay? So those are your customers, the ones closest to you. Cherish them, by the way. Hmm. The next circle are acquaintances. These are people that you've gotten to know a bit. They've gotten to know you a bit. And you're looking to make them a customer one way or the other, or they're looking to make you a customer one way or the other. And then the final circle are new people. These are people that come into your space who you are sizing up, so to speak, as potential customers. First, they're new. Then they become an acquaintance, meaning there's some interest in what you're doing. And then ultimately, they become a customer. Okay. All right? I've got a new book coming out on this whole subject as well. But there's a timeline in there too. The amount of time which takes a person, if we're looking at business relationships, to go from new to acquaintance to a customer is the key factor here. It's how we use our time. And the person that uses their time the best, that maximizes the 24 hours, is the person that is the most successful in life. The difference between me and Bill Clinton, for example, Bill Clinton at 51 became president of the United States. And at 51, I wasn't president of the United States, but the difference between him and But and you him, were making more money. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably true. <laughs> in fact, there's no question that's true. Maybe we but, should say Bill Gates. Uh, we can use Bill Gates. As a, that would be a perfect example. Oh. The difference is how we used our time. Bill Gates used his time relative to what he was doing to get him where he's going. So the only difference between you and Bill Gates or me and Bill Gates is one, Bill Gates used his time more effectively to achieve his ultimate goals than you and I used our time. And that is not a put down of either you or I. Right. It's just a difference in how we maximize or leverage that which we are given. So people say to me all the time, George, you have 16, 1700 well-developed relationships in your infrastructure or network of support. And these are some of the most powerful people on the planet. Oh, these are some of the most powerful people on the planet. Give us a couple uh, of examples just so people know. I mean, uh, Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey, Stedman Graham, Kwesi and Fume, President Clinton, you name it. These are people that I know have a relationship or some semblance of a relationship with. If I were to call, I would eventually get a call back or be responded to, I could even ask for something at a certain level and get that responded to. So the question is, how does one do that? Exactly. Just the difference in how I used my time, I had a goal of making sure that I developed relationships that I could, A, serve first, because you see, that's the key to networking. You give first, you serve first, the getting comes later. See, most of us are out here networking to get something. Right, right? trying to just get, get, right. get, 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 get. No, you network to give, and as you give, you get. Because of the law of reciprocation? Absolutely, the law of increasing return. That for every single thing that you give, you'll get 10 things in return. Now, you may not get it the day you want it or when you want it or how you want it. But if you chart a course and you stay that course, you will get it. Now, the farmer inherently understands the laws of increasing return and the laws of nature, because the laws of increasing return are congruent with the laws of nature. And the laws of nature tell us what? That we must plant seeds. And then what must we do to the seeds? We must give them water, give them fertilizer, cultivate them, give them time. And then over time, the seeds flower and bear fruit in great abundance. You plant two corn seeds, you get eight or 10 ears of corn. So we know that inside of our good deeds, inside of our caring and sharing and the nurturing of our relationships are the seeds of abundance. You plant a watermelon, when you harvest the watermelon, what's inside of the watermelon seeds? So as our good friend Jim Rowan tells us all the time, you're going to have to get good at one of two things in life, and that's either planting in the spring or begging in the fall. <laughs> that's you know? right. So I hope people are planting because we develop our relationships, our networks, because that's what we're really talking about. When we talk about relationships, we're really talking about networks. And it's through these networks that we acquire resources, both intellectual resources, perhaps even money, certainly time, advice, counsel. So it's 
through the human contact and connection that we get that which we need to succeed in life. So if that's true, and it is true, we must spend the time necessary cultivating and nurturing and developing relationships. So the question becomes, well, how does one do that? Right. That's what, what, I, was, key, that's what I was about to ask. <laughs> and the key is simply be nice to people. <laughs> Smile. Laugh. Hug people. Find someone each and every day to put your arms around and say, hey, hang in there. Keep doing what you're doing. Everything's going to be okay. This is more important than money. Be nice to people. Don't step on people's toes. There's an old saying in the networking world, be careful whose toes you step on today because they may be connected to the butt you may need to kiss tomorrow. <laughs> you know? So be nice to people. It is critical. People hear this saying all the time, oh, it's not what you know, but who you know. Do they forget the other half of the saying, Jerry? The other half of the saying, it's not what you know and who you know, but it's who knows you and what is it that they know about you. You see, you can know 300 really important people, but if they all think you're a jerk, you've got real problems. <laughs> so be nice to people. Treat everyone with dignity and respect. Understand that everybody is important, that everybody has value. And you see, as a master networker, I treat you with the kind of dignity and respect and love that you deserve. Don't prejudge people. So often we network with people and we prejudge the value that they bring to us. That's a very, very bad mistake that too many people make. Now, over time, you will understand what value you bring to another person and what they bring to you. But to make an instant evaluation of that based on how a person appears, mm -hmm. maybe even the color of their skin, is a very, very bad error in judgment. I have succeeded at the highest levels in America, and I can tell you that some of the most important things that have ever happened to me in my life have come from some of the most unsuspecting sources. You know, I have plumbers and I have presidents of Fortune 500 companies in my industrial strength Rolodex, and I can tell you that oftentimes the plumber is more important than the president wow. when I need a plumber. <laughs> right? That's right. Right. You ever try to get a plumber? You better be married to one, <laughs> or you better have one in your network. So everybody is important and everybody has value. Now, yes, over time, we all show our colors, so to speak, and we evaluate others. And if a person is not doing right by you, if a person does not support you in the way that you need to be supported, in the way that you ought to be supporting them, as I said earlier, we have to be very careful how we spend our time, because mm -hmm. all you're going to get is 24 hours a day. And, and I tell people all the time, do anything, but don't waste my time. I will get more money, but I will not get more time. And I don't know how much time I have. And I don't want to know how mm -hmm. much time I have. Mm -hmm. So the spending of your time is critically important. And that's why you cannot spend major time with minor people. Wow. You cannot spend a lot of time with someone going nowhere because they want you to go there with them. Nowhere. And people not doing anything want you to not do something with them. All of this is very easy to say and very hard to do. It's very hard to do because it requires us to shed, in quote, friendships and relationships that we have gotten comfortable with and had for a long time, good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, we wonder why some people stay in abusive relationships. I mean, right. they actually stay in abusive relationships. Right. And there's deep-seated psychological reasons and need, but the ability to extract ourselves from being with another human being just for the sake of being with a human being is something that a lot of people find difficult. More people than I'd like to admit find this extremely difficult. Some people would rather be with someone bad or not productive in their life than being alone. Some people cannot be alone. Sometimes it's better to be alone than to be in a destructive or not constructive 
or productive relationship. This is heady stuff that most people understand at a surface level, but when they try to act on it themselves, when they really take inventory of their friendships and relationships and where they're going in their own life, and I cannot say it enough, introduce me to your five closest friends and that will tell me who you are. As they know, as they go, you go. So is that a quick way to kind of indicate where a person is and where they're going and whether or not they're minor or major? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so if they're not getting where they want to go, if they're not doing the things that they want to be doing, if they're not succeeding at the levels in which they envision themselves succeeding, they must take inventory of the people they're hanging out with. And that's one of the things that most people just don't want to do. They don't want to do it. They're afraid that they might have to let some of these people go, or they're afraid of what they might find in regards to what they're right. discovering. Exactly. They're afraid of that. They're afraid that if they bring new people into their life that, in fact, are where they want to be, are succeeding at another level, and as they peel back the onion on these new people, they will see that these people are doing the work. They're taking the classes. They're making the calls. They are out in the world, engaged in the world, and engaged in life. And people don't want to do that. I mean, they don't want to do the work. Successful people are doing the work. There's no other way to be successful other than doing the work and going through the pain. There is no gain without pain. It's not possible. So successful people, people, again, who are at the top rungs of every ladder and every category on the planet have gone through pain, have done the work, continue to do the work, and are succeeding at the highest levels and are looking for people who think and act like they do. Mm. So do you believe that that's the reason why there's really not a whole bunch of competition when it comes to success because most people are not even going for it anyway? That's exactly right. I think it was Woody Allen who said many years ago that 90% of success is just showing up, (laughs) just being there. So that's critical. So most people don't even want to do the first part that you're talking about in regards to the whole stool of life concept with the education. Most people, they just feel once they get out of school, they're done being educated. So they look for other people and relationships and networks of contacts and infrastructures of support who think like them. Mm. Because that's what they're comfortable in. But if you investigate successful people and the keys to their success, they will tell you any day of the week. It's been the people that I've associated myself with who were reading the materials that I needed to be reading. They encouraged me to read them. They gave them to me to read. I mimicked or did the things that they were doing and experienced the same things that they experienced. Wow. And then that's how you also started that whole process of education, seeing some of the skills that some of these people had as well. Obviously, you kind of looked up to them. Is that how you started the process of giving your marketable skills? Absolutely. I put in my own mind's eye, I had several role models, people I wanted to emulate as I got older and became wiser and matured and accrued certain things in life. I didn't know them certainly well enough to ask them to mentor me, to take on the responsibility of nurturing me, but I read about them. There was enough written about them that I read about the things that they did, and I followed with great interest the things that they did in life, the moves that they made, the books that they read, and I did that. I've written about this on a number of occasions. So they became my models. Then There were several people along the way in my life who became my mentors, and they were five or six levels above me in life. They reached down and pulled me up toward them. As I reached back, wherever I was being pulled, I was pulling others to replace me and then to come with me. So that's really what networking looks like. If you look at it from a physical standpoint, Both arms would be stretched out. Mm -hmm. One arm would be pointed towards the sky, and that would be the hand attached to the person who is pulling you up. The other hand would be aimed towards the ground, and that would be the hand 
that you are using to reach down to pull someone else up. And that's what networking looks like, that someone is pulling you and you are always pulling someone. Now, the minute you break that connection in either direction, you have a hole in your net. And you know what happens when the fisherman gets a hole in his net? The fish get through too many holes and the whole infrastructure of support breaks down. So that's what effective networking looks like. Even if we apply this word to the world of technology, Mm -hmm. right? The world of technology uses the word networking. What does it mean? It means what? Sharing information through a technology. That's really what we're talking about when we talk about networking. Sharing, reaching down, lifting up, reaching back, pulling forward, giving first, investing in someone else. When you meet someone, you don't ask them for something. That's not how you start a relationship. That's not networking. That's begging. <laughs> right? It's two entirely different things. People say, I'm going to network with you to get something. Right. Well, that's not networking. That's begging. Right. You network to give. When you meet someone new for the first time, you don't immediately start asking them for stuff. What you're asking them for is information about themselves. That's what I'm asking. Right. When I'm meeting someone new. I want to learn more about you. Now, why do I want to learn more about you? To see if there's something in my inventory of skills, of intelligence, of products or services that I have that I can share with you to help make you better and to make your life more fulfilling. Mm. That's what I'm looking for. But the only way I'm going to know this is to ask you questions. And to try to find out about you and to see where the common ground is and how we can bond. And a relationship is built on shared experiences. And each time we share experience, that becomes a little bit more cement that we add to the relationship. And as we bond and cement the relationship, it then becomes a give and take. Wow. Sometimes, because I know there's people that are listening, they're saying, well, I just don't know all these great people. I don't know this and I don't know that. And what you're saying is that you don't really have to start off knowing them. You basically start reading about them, start studying them, start modeling them. And then from you doing that, you obviously started to take on some of their habits and some of their ways of action. And then you started to attract more of those people into your reality. That's exactly So you can actually establish, you know, relationships, so to speak just by really studying and going through the autobiographies of other people and so forth. And I think that was a very powerful point that could go over people's heads sometimes. But I think that's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Wow. Absolutely. I know one of my first great role models from afar was Earl Graves, publisher of Black Enterprise. Black Enterprise, yeah. Right. But I did not have a personal friendship with Mr. Graves. But I liked his style. I had seen him speak. I like what he was saying. I like what he represented. I liked how he took care of business. He had a very successful business. And so I mimicked as best as I could. I learned as much about him. I mimicked the way he dressed, his style. He was very educated, very cultured, had very powerful and positive things to say all the time. And so in a sense, I mimicked that and modeled my behavior around the behavior that I saw from afar until one day I attended an event where he was and I had a chance to meet him. And there was an immediate connection. And there was immediate connection because what he saw in me was him. Hmm. And so we started a friendship and a relationship that has lasted 20 years. And I ended up on the cover of his magazine Hmm. when I wrote my first book, Success Runs in Our Race. So, yes, you can meet anyone that you want. You can be anyone that you want. You can network with anyone that you want. This is America. There are exceptions to that rule. But it's a very powerful way, this whole notion of relationship development, because that's what we're talking about, building a relationship. Everything in your life will depend on that, because there is no success that you can attain, sustain, or maintain on your own by yourself in a vacuum. It's all about relationships. So if it's all about relationships, spend more time on relationships, and even the relationships that you desire to have, but don't have, 
A, you can still desire them. You can still imitate the good qualities that you see in them. I'm a great fan of biographies, and I'm a great fan of the Biography Channel. I just love learning about and reading about how people navigated their life and the dots that they connected and the things that they have done to move forth in life. And then my ears are so sensitive to this idea of relationships that every business deal, every piece of conversation or thing that I read as relates to business, I'm searching for how did this deal happen? Why did this person get a $10 million contract? What precipitated something occurring, one person over another? So I'm constantly looking for the threads of how that happened. And without exception, it all comes down to, and it's always written in the story, a relationship somewhere. Mm. Somebody knew the right person. That person liked them and respected them and trusted them. As I say to folks all the time, most business decisions are made at an emotional level, and then they're justified by facts. That people do business with people that they know, that they respect, but most importantly, that they like. I don't care what business you're in. There are at least 10 people that can do what you can do, and a few of them can do it better than you. And the yeah. reason I choose to do business with you is because I know you, I respect you, and I like you. Because this is America, and I have choices, and I don't have to do business with someone I don't like. When is the last time you did a piece of business with somebody you hated? Never. Okay. Right, right. So be nice to people and understand that where you're going, you're going to get there with and through other people, that someone's going to pull you there. You just don't know who that someone is going to be. So spend more time working on cultivating, nurturing, and developing your relationships at work, at home, and in the community. It is critical. Build your network. Not only is it critical, but it's very powerful, and it's not really being taught as much as it really should be taught. There's not enough attention being given to this topic, and this is probably one of the reasons why most people, when they tap into an entrepreneurial enterprise, they're not very successful at it because they haven't really built their networks in the there first place. Go. And I know you're very adamant about people being entrepreneurs and everything. And, you know, there's a lot of people listening. They have their own home-based business or they have their own business enterprise or whatever the case may be. Is there just a couple quick points on why you feel having your own business and being able to have entrepreneurial endeavors, why that's really important for people to have? I think if you look at the most recent study on self-made millionaires mm -hmm. in America, 74% are self-employed people, mm -hmm. people who take in the risk and started their own business. I live in a very upscale neighborhood in Cleveland, Ohio. There are 54 homes on my street. All of those homes are in the deep six and seven figures. And no one on my street has a job. <laughs> no one. Everybody on my street has a business. Wow. So that's so, big volumes in and of itself. That's right. So 74% of self-made millionaires today, if you want to get rich in America today, that's just what I'm telling you, mm -hmm. you want to be self-employed. That's A. 10% of self-made millionaires are senior executives. 10% are doctors and lawyers. So that's 84, 94. And then 5% of self-made millionaires today are salespeople. So in America, two things are going on 24-7. Somebody's buying and somebody's selling. Okay. Stop doing all the buying and do some selling. <laughs> and I don't care what it is that you sell. I don't care if you make cookies, <laughs> put them in a box, put a ribbon around it, and sell it to somebody. Sell someone something. And if you live on a farm, take the manure, put it in a bag, put your name on it, and you can be an entrepreneur. Okay? <laughs> sell it to somebody. This is America. Stop just buying and do some selling. 5% of self-made millionaires are salespeople. That's why I love network marketing. It's a great way to begin to understand the process of word of mouth selling and selling in general. And it's a great way to enter business. It's a low cost way to become self-employed. Wow. And then 
10% of self-made millionaires, mm-hmm. in spite of all of the hype, in spite of all of the coverage, mm-hmm. if you put together people who've earned their millions in the stock market, lotteries, sports, and entertainment, if you add all of those people together, they represent less than 1% of self-made millionaires in this country. Wow. Start a business. So start a business, and we should be proud to be in direct sales or have a home-based business or network marketing. We should be proud of it. Absolutely. You control your own life. You control your own destiny. You control the economics of your family. You are modeling something that is powerful for your children. Now, both of my children work in my business. I'm very proud of that. Mm. But the main question Mm -hmm. that I ask when people say, listen, I'm going to start a business. I don't ask them about money. Right. That's the last thing I ask. Okay. First is, do you have the relationships in place to succeed? Wow. That stops them in their tracks. Wow. And so that really shows that most people really haven't been cultivating these relationships. Like you said, you said successful people utilize like 54% of their time right. cultivating these relationships. You do, you know, 60% of your time. Right. And people who are effective, about 14%, that means right. they're effective, they're able to get by and all that. Right. And so the relationships, it goes right back to that, how That's critical right. and how important relationships are. Do you That's have powerful. the relationships in place to succeed in your business? And most people start stuttering, huh? They start stuttering. <laughs> I don't even ask them about money. I don't care how much money they have. It doesn't matter. Wow. That is powerful. Well, I'll tell you what, Mr. Fraser, this has definitely been some very powerful insights that we've been able to gain here. And I notice you say you have a book that really discusses more about the relationships and how to develop them. And what's the name of that book? Well, I have two books. One is Success Runs in Our Race, The Complete Guide to Effective Networking in the African-American Community. And aside from some cultural and spiritual underpinnings and background that Success Runs in Our Race teaches people of color, people of African descent, let's say the first third of the book deals with the cultural aspects of developing unique relationships. But two-thirds of the book deals with all the other sort of everyday generic principles that apply regardless of color. Mm -hmm. So it's a powerful book to read regardless of color. It's a very interesting book to read if you are a person of color or if you want to know more about people of color in what is becoming a more diverse America. So that success Mm -hmm. runs in our race. The Complete Guide to Effective Networking in the African-American Community, a bestseller for three and a half years. And then the other is Race for Success. Mm. You know, and I want to say one thing about success runs in our race. What you just said was very critical because I have people coming up to me all the time. And these are people that are not of African descent, not African-Americans and so forth. And so, Jerry, how do I tap into the African-American community? How can I sponsor or bring in more black people in my group and all this type of stuff? And so the first third of that book just by them understanding. That's right. Right? Is that what you're saying? That's exactly right. And we should be learning more about each other. America is becoming a more diverse workplace. And many of America's corporations and certainly many of its multi-level marketing organizations are looking to tap into cultural minorities, which is a growing and ever more influencing population in this country. You know, we may have come over here on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. Wow. That's powerful. And now, how can we go about getting the book? Can we go to your website? Is yeah. that how we can order your books? I know you have some powerful tapes as well, because I order a bunch of tapes from your website that has some of the past conferences that you've done, and you have some of the most powerful people actually on these particular CDs and tape programs that you have. Can you give us that website address? Sure. Our website is www.frasernet.com. That's F-R-A-S is in Sam, E-R-N-E-T.com. And they can order books and tapes and get information about the Power Networking Conferences in June of every year in Cleveland, Ohio. Or they can call at 216-691-6686. That's 216-691-6686. Wow. And let me just ask you the last question as we're closing up. Why do you do what you do? Why do you go around really teaching these principles in a passionate way and sharing this information? And given of yourself, just like you just gave with all of us on the interview here, sharing all this powerful information, it's probably kind of evident in regards to the relationships and how giving you are. But is there anything else that we should know? You know, why do you do this? I mean, you've accumulated money and wealth, and you can kind of like sit at home and do what you want. So why do you continue to do this? It's part of a deep spiritual belief that I have that the creator 
gives us information, knowledge, and let us call that power to share, not to keep. And the more we share it, the more we give it away, the more comes back to us. We never give to get. Wow. We never give to get. But understand that it is impossible to give and not get. Mm. That is how the creator has designed the system. So giving and sharing what I have been so privileged to receive from others and to learn through experience is part of the circle of life. It is part of how I thrive and, most importantly, that thing that makes me feel most good, the greatest. The best I can feel is when I'm having a conversation like this with you and an audience, or whether I'm speaking or whether someone is reading what I've learned. The best I can feel is to know that people are getting something from what I've learned, and it's helping to improve and to better their life. There's nothing on earth that can replace that feeling, not even money. That's what I believe we've all been put here to do. And as we do that, we will be enormously enriched. We will have in abundance. You will get back far more than you ever give. So I lead a life of loving, giving, serving, adding value someone and something because that is the purpose of life. Well, and Mr. Fraser, that's exactly what you've done over the time that you spent with us. You've given to us and you've been given to people all around the world, which is why you have been able to accomplish what you've been able to accomplish in your testament of this principle. And that's really neat because a lot of people write books and so forth, but they're not really testament of what they're writing. And so I just want to thank you for being a testament of what you're writing. And I know that the audience here are definitely going to go and get your books, Success Runs in Our Race, as well as A Race for Success, and start to ingrain some of these principles more into their consciousness and understand how important these are in not only their professional life. Yes, people develop some serious professional situations and financial and prosperity and all that, but just the things that you can utilize in the personal relationships that you talk about as well is very powerful. So I just want to thank you for taking the time to share with us. And for everyone, go ahead, make sure you visit Mr. Fraser's website at www.frasernet.com. Take a look at these materials and go ahead and pick up some of these materials and continue to gain some of this powerful information that Mr. Fraser has just shared with us. I'm sure you're going to rewind this, listen to it over and over and over again, just like I am. Mr. Fraser, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to share with us today. It's been my honor and my pleasure. You keep doing God's work and you've charted an incredible course. I just urge you to stay that course. Excellent. So, uh, everyone, this has been Jerry Clark at www.clubrhino.net, Mr. George Fraser at www.frasernet.com. Then be sure to keep charging and always remember to go, go, go. 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 All right. Woo!